Hi, everyone. Hello, hi, Nechama. Hi. How's it going? Going great. I'm super excited about this webinar. <laughs> Me too. Super excited about everyone joining us. Hi, everyone. So we're going to wait another maybe one minute for everyone to join, and uh, then we're going to start. Meanwhile, I see you do it already. Uh, feel free to introduce yourselves um, and say maybe where you're from in the, in the chat. Um, we'll be on the chat the entire webinar, so feel free to ask questions, interact. Um, we'll be attentive. And yeah, we'll start in maybe one more minute. You look great, by the way. Thank you. Wow. Hi, Heike from Berlin. Hi, Kistanos. Kistantos, sorry, from UK. Hey, Denmark, Barcelona. Wow. To what? To the to the webinar? I'll send it to you. Wow, okay, nice. Hi everyone, hi Milan, hi Denmark, Andra, hi Davide. Hey Thomas, ah, good to see you. All right, nice. This is fun. Me and Hama already had our glasses of wine, so I think this webinar is gonna be fun. For those of you who are in Europe, <laughs> I feel like this is a beer o'clock for everyone, huh? If you're in, a, if you're in the States or in the Americas, please uh, stay professional. I think it's Thursday. It's the beginning of the weekend, so they can for grab us. a beer, lunch beer. Is. All right. Tell me, tell me if... Uh, if you feel like we can start. Um, yeah, I think we can definitely start. If you want, we can wait another minute. We can see people are joining us. There are actually representatives from our resellers. Hi, Yaroslav. And Mark is saying that it's lunchtime in US, so drink our K. Okay. Hello from Romania. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, yeah, I think we can definitely. Thank you, Stelios. I think you're from, from uh, Greek, according to your name. So yeah, I'm excited as well. All right, Yatam, I think it'll be a good time to start, to get going. All right. Um, OK, so um, hi, everyone. Nechama, I'm going to kind of like turn you off for a minute. <laughs> we'll see Nechama in a second. Um, so hi, everyone. <clears throat> Should I put headphones on? No, I'll look better with that. So welcome everyone to today's webinar. Um, today we're going to talk about Environment for Revit version 12. Uh, for those of you who are new to environment, it is an essential part of landscape and site design in Revit, helping you with every step of the project's life cycle. <clears throat> so hello, while people keep uh, joining us, I would like to take literally five minutes to explain this amazing add-on uh, before we jump ahead to version 12. So we've created environment uh, to assist you on every sta uh, stage of your project from the initial analysis through the planning stage and all the way to the final documentation phase. Environment is packed with over 60 powerful tools organized into different sections. Yeah, the section here above. Um, 
providing an efficient and intelligent approach to outdoor design. Starting from the left of your environment tab, you'll find the model element section. We fully automated the process of modeling walls, slabs, railing, and curves for the end uh, for the need of outdoor design. So these tasks, depending on the project, might range from a minor challenge to a significant headache, but can be done in seconds with the environment tools. Next, the model lines, um, featuring useful tools for drawing model lines and setting their elevation to represent topography contours. This is the most com common workflow among landscape professionals, and these tools make it fun and so much more simple. It's much more like understandable than the GIF that you're looking at. But interoperability is another important part of auto design. Environment allows you an intuitive and a super efficient way to import CAD elements into Revit, as well as smooth back and forth collaboration with civil 3D and other civil software. Also, collaboration often means dealing with geolocation and shared coordinates. Now, historically speaking, those things were never easy, causing so much pain and frustration for BIM managers. So that's why we've developed Set Coordinates, a tool that solves all problems of this kind. This entire section got some significant improvements in the new version, and the Chama uh, will show you some cool stuff in a presentation. Next, we're really proud of the comprehensive suite of top-notch tool for grading and analysis. Environment is tailored to handle every grading challenge you may encounter, whether it's creating surfaces from scratch or modifying the terrain to align with your creative vision. We've got you covered. Also, I'm really excited about this point cloud to topography. We'll see it in a second. Um, let's explore our planting tools. We've developed tools to, to streamline process of creating planting plants through clever bulk actions, such as the area scatter and the line scatter. And even though we've just released environment 12, by the way, it's live now. If you'll download it, it'll be 12. We are ready, uh, we're already working on new tools for version 13 with some awesome features for planting projects. Stay tuned for exciting updates. By the way, it's worth, uh, it's worth noting that elements created or modified using environment are Revit native. This ensures smooth, smooth collaboration when sharing your project. Others can work on the same file without requiring environment to be installed on their device, which is awesome. On the right side of your environment ribbon is our presentation section. We've equipped environment with tools to simplify the documentation process, ensuring that your documents not only meet professional standards, but also look absolutely fabulous. And that's it. To be honest, I think that was five minutes. That's a quick roundup for our five minutes. Um, before I'm tossing the mic to Nechama, we have a prize for you. So it's a free environment license for a year. Um, and if you'd like to join the raffle, all you have to do is type environment 12 exclamation mark in the chat. Please, 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 I'm talking to you know people of the future. If you're watching the recording, because it's going to be live on YouTube, it happens every time. Don't write anything in the comment section. It's not gonna, it's gonna be worthless. Yeah, but right now, if you're watching it live, please, environment 12 exclamation mark. Um, also, throughout the entire webinar, feel free to ask questions at any point in the chat. I will collect them and we'll answer them all during the webinar. Um, so I think that's it. Now I'll give the, the mic to Nechama, right? Let's bring you back up here. Hi. Hi. How's it going? Thank you for the introduction. Um, so when we started the webinar, we saw that um, some of the subscribers have never used environment before. So we're really happy to have you here. I hope you would love what you see. And for those of you who are already very much familiar with environment, I think you're going to get excited. Um, we're doing our best to get better from one version to another. So uh, we've been working about this on this version for quite a while. So without further ado, um, let's jump in. I'm going to give you the Revit. stage and I'm going to disappear for now. So good luck. Bye, everyone. See you later. Okay. All right. So I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to take this one away from here. Um, so yes, let's get started. I've prepared, oh, sorry, I've prepared um, the demo files. So we have a lot to cover for today. 
Um, we're going to start with the small improvements and then make our way slowly but surely into the really exciting new features. So brace yourself, um, keeping the best to the last. So stay tuned um, until we finish. All right. So I'm not going to give another um, intro. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, clicking on the environment. By the way, if you want to know what version you have, just go ahead to the general description and check it. You're going to have version 12. It's out right now. So I'm going to start with the smallest improvement to the uh, model line tools. And for that, I'm going to go to the architecture tab, model line, and simply use the spline tool to create a sketch of let's say I'm creating contour lines for topography and I'm using three-dimensional model lines to do that. If you already used the environment before, that's a pretty common tool. That's one of our most common tools. So we have these few nice um, flat lines and to assign elevation to them, I'm going to use the set elevation tool. Now, if you use the environment before, you probably know that all the parameters of the set elevation tool used to be right here. And what we did to increase your flexibility and make it a super um, intuitive workflow. As you click on set elevation in version 12, you can see that we started to use the options bar for all the settings. So you have here the option to use the check elevation symbol, which will mark the elevation of each line, to change the text type, the start elevation, the increment, and just as before, you can control the elevation base and the color override, which is here just to have a, some sort of uh, indication to what lines exactly are we changing. So I'm going to check with, uh, stick with the use check elevation symbol and change the text style. So over here, you'll have all the text styles in your project. And now, just like before, let me start with five meters and go every one meter. You can either change the elevation of a line um, one by one, just like this, click, right, one by one. And you can see I have the check elevation symbols over here, or you can do it another way. Let's turn off the check elevation symbol. And now let's give it a negative value to go down. And as I click outside of my lines, somewhere over here, you can see that I get this crossing line over here. So all the lines that I will cross will immediately be affected. Let's click. And you can see the changes. All right. So we're going all the way down. Let's do it again. Go from five down. Um, let me change the scale so you'll see the symbols. I'm just going to click one time here, going down all the way here. So you can see the lines. So this is the set elevation. Everything is in the options bar. Now you can see this tech, this um, check elevation symbols. Let's just go ahead and assume that I forgot to place them. Delete, right? So as you probably know, we have the check elevation feature, which will show you the elevation of these lines. And for this one as well, we added the all the options in the options bar. So we can use the crossing line, or we can do it one by one, right? So let's take a look at the options here. We added the keep readable option, apply changes. So if you don't use the keep readable option, it would just uh, be oriented, uh, oriented to the downhill of the slope. If you use the keep readable, it will be oriented to the view. You can change the text style, click on apply changes, and this was a very much requested uh, improvement from a lot of our clients. We finally added the option to change the elevation base of these um, check elevation symbols. All right, so that was a very small but super, super important and efficient um, improvement that we just added, and I'm really happy about it. And let's move forward to another really nice improvement. Let's go ahead and take a look at that topography tools, right? So <clears throat> you probably know that we're creating all these model lines to create a topography from it. So let's go to the add lines and add the lines to the topography, click on add line. 
And to show you the next improvement, I'm just going to select these two points over here, copy them to make my surface a little bit bigger. And maybe just for the sake of the example, I'm going to drop them down one or two meters. All right. So the next improvement is only available in versions 2024 and up. Um, because as you probably know, our topography tools are a little bit different for the topo solid and for the topo surfaces. So versions 2020 to 2023, you will only see these tools available in the topography tools and in 2024, you know, and of course the place point. And in 2024, you will have all these cute additions. And the new tool that we have added to the topography tools is the draw split line option. So as you probably know, in floors, top of solids and roofs, Revit has a split line, but it is only a straight line. And um, we are kind of in the process of repurposing the split line to make working with topographies a lot more flexible. So the split lines are usually only straight, but if you're using environment topography tools, you can use curved or splines. So let me use the absolute elevation option. Of course, here, don't forget, you can also define a different elevation base. So I'm going to place my split line at four meters. By the way, you can also place it along surface, but I'll demonstrate the absolute option. So I have a spline here, and I'm just going to create a beautiful spline straight on my topography. Click on Escape to finish the drawing and go to Insert Split Line. Now, again, because split lines are only flat in Revit, we kind of um, did this thing where you have a lot of tiny split lines and you have a lot of points and then you can um, achieve this smoothness of a line. So I can do another one, let's say, 3.8 and this might be a really good way to maybe create a path on your topography <clears throat> and really there's a lot of things that you can do with it and for us at Arc Intelligence I think it's maybe just the first step of using this draw split line tool so if you've known environment for more than one version you probably know there are good, good stuff coming uh, with this tool over here. Another nice improvement to the topography tools is, let me select all the points and voila, we have a filter now. So you can actually filter out the points that you have chosen um, according to whether they're boundary points, internal points, or just regular split lines. So for example, let's select all the points on the boundary and drop them down one meter. You see, it was very, very easy, although in this case, it's a little bit ugly. So don't worry, I have the undo over here. And of course, I can select all my points again, go to the filter, make sure that I select the split lines. Don't worry if you don't see the selection, just go close and you can see it behind um, the points in blue. Let's drop it down one meter. And you can see the split lines changing um, on the topography. So these were the two, um, I can call it improvement, although the draw split line is a totally new tool. For me, it's a game changer. It's something that I've been waiting for a long time. And hopefully going forward, this tool can take on a life of its own, just like our match reference surface tool. So this is a tool that we have introduced in uh, the last version in environment 11. And the purpose of the match reference surface tool is to just be able to copy elevation points from one topo surface or one topography to another. And um, this tool became so popular that um, for convenience, we have actually placed it in so many more places. So let's click on finish and take a look <clears throat> at how this works. So aside um, from being um, inside the topography tools, we've also placed it over here. You can see it in the terrain and site component panel. By the way, pay attention, we changed a little bit the organization in our panels. Um, so the match reference surface is here as well. 
<clears throat> but it is also in a different place. So let me show you a small example. I'm going to select and isolate all these um, elements. And as I um, select all these toposolids in the modify tab, I get the match reference surface. So again, we're always thinking about how are you going to use it and try to place it in places that will be really, really comfortable for you to use. So I can select all of these, click on the match reference surface, and now I just have to select the reference toposolid. Now, I really like this example over here because it kind of shows the workflow where at the beginning of the project, you might um, design a surface to have a certain slope, but then later on in different stages of the design, you will want to apply more details to this design. So at the beginning, I just designed the building pad, but now going forward, um, the lot under the buildings should have a lot more details, but the slope doesn't change. So all I have to do is to pick all these topo solids and, um, and then just select the original surface. You can see that as I select it, I can see all the points that I created it from. Click on apply. And immediately these um, other topo solids will inherit the original, um, the original slope. So let me just delete this one and maybe rehost these houses. So the match reference surface can really be um, a good tool for a lot of situations, but I, I like this example that shows different stages of the design going from very preliminary to more detailed design, but still keeping the original slope. Again, you can just select it from here and then you'll have to select the original surface and then the other surfaces that you want to use. And it will do just the same. So there are many ways to use it. Um, I invite you to explore how the match reference surface logics can really help streamline your design. By the way, if you guys have any questions, feel free to write them down in the chat. And when I finish, um, Yotam will read them all to me. So at the end, um, I'm going to be available to answer questions. All right. So we've seen some nice uh, model lines and topography tools. And now it's the time to move forward to some more interesting tools. Again, bear with me as I go from the interesting to the very interesting. Um, all right, so in this file, you can see a very detailed planting design that I have created. And over here, my workflow was the same. I was going from preliminary design all the way to detailed. So when I started um, this project, I used a regular Revit area plan to just create the layout of my planting plan. And you can see how nice areas in Revit are, how useful they are. They can really give me a nice planting schedule. But going forward, <clears throat> I had to place all the planting families on top of these areas. And that's where our um, area scatter tool is going in the picture that allows me to really place these elements over here. So let's take a look at my workflow over here. I'm gonna to go to this view, which I used as a basis for my planting plan. And you can see that all of these are planting assemblies. So what I'm going to do now is demonstrate the area scatter tool. And on the way, I will show you the improvement that again, um, thank you so much for your feedback because this was highly requested by clients. So the first thing is to select the area. If you know environment, you probably know that anything can be an area. It can be a topo solid, a topo surface, a subregion, a floor, a roof. In this case, I'm just gonna select this area as my ba base. Um, by the way, it can also be from a linked file. So really any surface you have visible, you can check. Um, select it as the basis for your area scatter. I'm going to click on apply selection and select the plant that I want to place here. So this is the one. Um, these are the distances. So here is the improvement that we have here. You can see that some of the plants really sit on the boundary of the area scatter. Some of them even go out of it because 
it's calculated according to the center of each family. Um, so what we added in this version is the option to offset from boundary. So let's create like 20 centimeter um, offset. In this case, I don't want the triangulated grid. I'll just go with a regular grid now. And um, no, uh, no rotation. Please, if you're new to our tools, make sure to check the create assembly um, option over here. It, will, it is really important and you'll see in a second what you can do with the create assembly option. I'm gonna click on apply now. So basically uh, with environment planting tools, whether it's the area scatter or line scatter or even um, the planting region or a tree connection line, all of our tools are designed to create a Revit assembly. And what we did, we also added an information into these assemblies, which allow you to tag them later on. By the way, this uh, file takes a long time. This should be really taking a few seconds um, in other files. Um, so you can see that now I have the 20 centimeters um, offset, again, from the center of my plant. So you can go ahead and play a little bit with the rotation, try to fit in more plants, maybe use a triangulated grid, but as long as you're creating an assembly from it, you can always go back to the area scatter tool and change and modify and play with it as much as you want. So now, as I said before, um, we have this assembly content feature, which means that every assembly you create with Environment for Revit has this parameter. Yes, this is an environment for Revit feature. And the parameter contains information about the assembly. In this case, for example, um, let's go back to the previous plan. I designed this parameter to show the number of plans and the type mark. So where can you change it? Again, this is not new, but I'll show you the improvement in a second. So over here in the presentation panel, you can find the assembly content settings. In the last version, we introduced the option to really add any parameter, any parameter that you want, even if it's an instance parameter, family parameter, shared parameter, anything. But in this version, we also added the option to assign the assembly content parameter to assemblies that weren't created with environment for Revit. So as long as you go to the presentation panel, to the assembly content settings <clears throat> and make sure that this um, parameter is checked, all your um, assemblies will create will have the parameter. If you forgot to do it, don't worry, you will have a red notice here and you'll just have to click on something and you'll be able to um, apply the parameter even after you finished. So let me click on OK and show you a tiny example of how it works. I'm just going to go to, um, sorry. I have something here in my file. Let me go all the way here, go back here. OK. So I'll demonstrate it over here. So let's say um, that's the reason. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the component. Uh, to the uh, in to place a component. Sorry for that. I'm gonna place a bunch of tables and chairs. So let's say you're designing a restaurant and you want to create the layout, the sitting layout, and then you want to tag them all together. So all you have to do is select them and turn them into an assembly. Let's call them furniture or four, and then. As you select this assembly, you can see that you have the assembly content parameter. Let's go to the annotate, tag by category, and just tag these five coffee tables. How convenient. Now, the nice thing is that if I go now and, for example, I don't know, add a bench. Oh, let's add something with a simpler name for the sake of the example. And I just place the bench over here go to edit assembly and just add the benches. You can see how fast the assembly content parameter would update along with it. And if I delete one of them, it updates. 
So again, this one can have so many uses. It originally was created for uh, planting families, but you know already what you can do with it um, potentially. Moving forward um, to the next improvement. And again, this is something that a lot of clients uh, requested and I'm so happy to be here and to tell you that we are able to accommodate our clients' requests. Um, you can see this beautiful um, legend that I have here. Um, this is a schedule that is also a legend. And if you know Environment for Avid, you know that the family thumbnail feature is responsible for that. So basically, the family thumbnail feature just automatically create thumbnail images um, to go along with your families. And up until now, it was only available for loadable families. But in version 12 and forward, it's also available for system families, such as floors and walls. And let's see a small example of how it works. So I already have a simple floor schedule over here. It just shows the types of floors that I have um, in my project. And I'm going to go to environment, family, thumbnail. Look how nice it's organized. You can really select you know, specific families, or you can select an entire category. And then let's say I wanted to show on consistent, uh, consistent colors. And maybe also I want to do it on a 3D view. All right, let's click on OK. And our environment will think and calculate. And again, just create a, an image thumbnail for all these families. So once I have this image creation finished, I'm going to click on close. And all I have to do now is, is add the relevant parameters. So let's go back to fields. And you can see over here that I have the family thumbnail parameter. I'm just going to put it over here in my schedule. Oh, not this one. Let's go to family thumbnail. Click on OK. And nothing happened, right? So let's go to the sheet, take our schedule put it on our sheet. And now we get this beautiful legend that is made um, from um, the schedule. By the way, let's say that I didn't like the 3D view or that my boss was like, what is this stupid thing that you put there? It has to be a plan view, right? So don't worry, uh, your boss would be really happy because you can very quickly change it. Let's say top view. Keep the same save bat, click on OK, and then environment will think again for a second. And again, it depends how many families you chose to um, create all at once. For me, it was pretty quickly. And look how fast it updates. So again, really nice, um, really flexible, all the way from modeling to documentation. I know environment for Revit is really the best. Um, all right, so we went through all of these improvements. Brace yourself, it's time for some of the new features. And here is where it's going to be very interested, interesting. So for these new features as well, I'm going to start with the smallest one and go all the way to the very, very interesting. Just let me take a sip of water. OK, so. We have a small real estate issue um, in Environment for Revit, and this is why you should really look hard in the model element panel. Take a look at this beautiful thing over here. This is the new curb ramp tool. So as part of our commitment to allowing you to create really useful B models that allow you to schedule everything, but also to have you know, a very high level of detail, um, we thought that this feature, as much as it can be simple, is extremely necessary. And again, the idea came from a client. And I can't stress this enough. Please communicate with us. We love hearing your ideas. So as you open the curb ramp um, feature, you get this window over here and this diagram that shows you the different parts of the curb ramp, the ramp running, the side flare and the target element. And let's see how this um, diagram um, uh, can help you understand the parameters. 
So under the diagram, we have these three um, checkpoints over here. These are, these are actually three different types of curb ramps that you can create, and I'm going to show you each and every one of them. So let's start with two points with flare. Under that, you have the settings. So what is the ramp running slow? For me, it's 8% because that's the standard here in Israel. But you can um, use whatever value you want over here to make sure you're ADA compliant or compliant with any standards that you want. And then I'm going to define the flare literal, uh, lateral sl uh, slope, which means the slope that will go on the um, curb stone of the sidewalk. So that's the slope over here. I'm going to leave the slope to target element check, and that's what I'm going to show you now. So what does it mean target ele element? For example, I want a ramp that goes from the si sidewalk to the target that is the road, all right? And next, we have the option to change the material. Now, why do we need to change the material? Um, basically, this is a very simple feature that takes the floor or the topo solid and just modifies its sub element. But a lot of times we want to be able to see, to visualize this ramp. But also, if we change the material, it means that we can use a material takeoff and really schedule the area of this material. So I'm going to click over here and then I'm going to get the material libraries in Revit. Revit. Let's click on curb ramp, select this yellow material, click on OK, and you can see it changed over here. And last, we have the place ramp family. It's checked, which means we will have a certain family that we can later schedule, um, and we will see it in a second. So now let's go to the magic. I'm going to click on the sidewalk. And by the way, don't forget to look down here and say and see select first point, right? So I'm going to click anywhere on the sidewalk. Environment is going to realize on its own where are the edges of this sidewalk. I'm going to click here again. And I'm going to click mm -hmm. on the road now. So the road is my target. And now environment has changed the sub elements. Yes, I want to update the slab contours. Thank you very much. So the contours on my sidewalk would change accordingly. And yeah, basically that's it. So three clicks and I have a RAM. Let's try the two points without flare. And this time I'm going to start from the road all the way to the sidewalk. So click one, two, three, and we have a RAM. Let's do it again. Four points by sketch, no flare. This time I'm going to uncheck the sloped target element and I'm going to manually define the vertical distance between the sidewalk and the road. I'm going to click one, two, three, four. And then it would just change. You can see the kind of ramp that we have. By the way, you also have undo and redo options embedded within the feature. So I can just undo this ugly ramp and go back over here and show you how it reacts when we have a curved road. So one, two, you can see it getting curved, three, all the way to the road. And <clears throat> then we have the curved ramp. All right, thank you for being a reliable feature. Whenever you demonstrate a software, that's a really a scary thing. I have to tell you, it's not for the weak hearted. All right, so let's click on okay. And I wanna share with you um, one last uh, tip about this tool. So, um, you know, two last tips. Remember I told you there's a family for you to schedule. So basically what we're doing is creating these line-based adaptive family. And the only purpose for this um, to be here is for you to have something to schedule, pedestrian curb ramps, so you can know how many you have in your project. But another thing that I wanted to tell you is that um, if you know, if you remember from before, these are just changes to the sub elements, right? It's the same surface. 
but let's say that I really hate this yellow that I chose before, what would I do now? I can simply go to the Modify tab and use the regular Revit um, Remove Paint or Paint option. So I can just go to Remove Paint and get rid of it. So nothing that you do is unchangeable, right? Everything, um, everything is for you to be able to change back. Let's do curb ramp one, two, three. Okay, so we're always writing on Revit native tools, really to allow you to live within the Revit ecosystem, to have um, a healthy file. Okay, so I'm going to close this um, file right now, and I will open another one to demonstrate another new tool. So um, let me go to three coordinates from point cloud and open it up. Um, so again, we were having a hard time understanding whether to call it an improvement or a new tool. For me, it's a new feature, but it is within an existing feature. So some of you may know that we have the set coordinates tool that allows you to geolocate your Revit files, no matter what, if they're already located, if they're not located, if you have a survey, if you don't have a survey, it allows you to geolocate and acquire share coordinates. Um, and I'm not gonna go too deep into this tool, but if this is interesting to you, please um, subscribe to our new newsletter and follow us on, um, social media because we are about to release a whole new article and tutorial solely about geolocation in Revit, solving all the coordination issues. Um, but I want to show you a new improvement to this feature. So basically, let's say that you don't have a survey at all. Maybe you just have a PDF or a JPEG. Maybe you only have one point that you know the coordinates of this point. So usually in Revit, you can go to the manage um, specify coordinates at point, but it can only um, be used on one point. With environment, however, you can use it on several points. And in this way, you can also get the, ro the real world rotation of your project. So what I'm going to show you now is how to use the set coordinates tool on a simple PDF, JPEG, CAD file, whatever you want, right? So let's go to environment, set coordinates, and immediately we get the location window. I'm just going to type here Israel because that's where my project is. And I only have to place this um, point on the map somewhere along my region to be able to select the, cor the correct coordinate system or datum. Let's click on OK. And now the set coordinates window is opened. <clears throat> First, I'm going to define the project base point elevation. For me, it's going to be zero. For you, it might be something else. And again, I'm not going to go too deep into other features. Please go into our user guide, follow us. There is a lot of explanations. Um, Oded from my team is doing a great work on this, um, on this uh, aspect. Let's go to the additional actions. And here's where the new tool is. Specify control points. Right. Um, by the way, there is another option to do it from a point cloud. So if you have a point cloud and you know about the location of certain points, you can also do it from that. A lot of flexibility. So specify control points. And in this case, I have to specify the um, coordinates in specific control points. And I pre-created some detail lines just to give me more accuracy. So I traced the PDF with detail lines. Let me select the first point over here, and then I get this one, and I have to fill it. Now I really have to concentrate, right? So my northing is 793-150. My easting is 254-450. Click on OK, and you see the point marked over here. I'm going to do three points. You can do as many as you want. The more points you do, the more accuracy you get. So I'm just going to do 793-100. Oops, sorry, that's the northing. Up. And my easting is going to be 254-450. If you type really wrong uh, points, it might just be impossible to do it because it doesn't make sense with the local coordinate system. 
So you'll you'll be you'll get an indication if you um, make a mistake. So northern here is seven nine two seven five zero. Stay with me. Two five four nine five zero. Click on OK. For me, three points is enough. I did it all the way in the other edge for more accuracy. Click on OK. Pray to God that you typed everything correctly. And yes, you have. So process has completed successfully. The nice thing about it is that you get an indication of what is the tolerance. So how accurate exactly is this thing? And this is a really nice um, accuracy here. Very close. All right. So that's it, right? But now we need a little bit of proof. How do we know that it's correct? You're totally right. So let's go to the annotate uh, spot coordinates. And you can see now that my coordinates are correct, 254, 450, et cetera. Um, but there's another, another way that you can see it. Um, let's go to the insert link CAD. And I'm going to take the same CAD file that um, was that created the PDF basically for the example and place it by shared coordinates. Take it, uh, um, link it to my file by shared coordinates, click on open. And then I'll get this message. Yep, close and it's aligned into place. All right. Another way that you can see if um, if your plan is rotated and you know what the north is, let's change the or orientation of the view from project north into true north. So everything indicates that everything is correct. So that's a great way to start working later on. Maybe you get a survey, maybe you get other files from other uh, team members. I promise you, everything will fall into place because you're geolocated and you re you're within um, a shared coordinate system, a local coordinate system. All right, um, stay with me. It's gonna get more excited. So now this one, um, this next, um, oh no, I didn't want to save that, but whatever. So this next feature that I'm going to show you, I love it. I think it's so sophisticated. It's like magic. And I'm so happy to demonstrate it on the new Revit uh, sample file. So I don't know if you guys know it, but um, the Revit 2024 has a really nice new sample file that uh, was partly created with a point cloud. Um, and you don't get the point cloud in the files um, in your computer, but because it's so heavy, but it's available to download from the Autodesk uh, website. So I thought it would be nice to demonstrate our tool on this one. So let me just um, isolate the point cloud. So what I wanna show you is the point cloud to topography feature here, new in the terrain and site components. So what exactly is this feature going to do? Well, we built an algorithm. I mean, I didn't build any algorithm, but our programmers, which are really smart, um, they build an ar algorithm that can identify the parts of the point cloud that are ground or topography or, you know, surface and differentiate them from anything else that is a building, a lamppost or anything. So you can click uh, one click and create a topography, which is pretty great. So let's see how it works. I'm going to click on the point cloud um, to topography feature, select my point cloud, and then I get this box to indicate that everything within this box is going to be taken into consideration. Um, I have to warn you, this might take a while to calculate. The bigger your topography is, the, the more time it will take to calculate. So for the sake of this example, I'm going to specify a region. So let's say you don't want to use the entire point cloud. Let's say that your design is only in a specific region. I'm just going to define this region over here. I'm going to take this small section and click on apply region. Um, so there you can see this three dimensional thing that allows you to see what part of the point cloud is included. And you can see that I 
intentionally included some of the buildings just so you can see um, how the feature works. One last note, you can define the maximum amount of points on each topography. So it probably means that if there's a lot of points on one surface, it will just divide it into several parts. So let's go with create, select the topo solid type. Um, I just want to tell you, if you're using another Revit version that is 2020 and up, don't worry. All the features that you've seen today will be available in all Revit versions. The only features that are available to Revit 2024 and up are topo solid related features. So basically this feature in 2023 will just give you an option to create a topography, a topo surface. So wait, where is my topo surface? Oh, there it is. Sorry, topo solid. So you can see it created here, but let's just um, take a minute to examine the results and see what happens. So I'm going to use a selection box over here. Um, let's take it up a little bit so we can see the buildings. And let's cut here. So this is the nice part. I really like seeing how accurate this is because um, you can really see that the topo solid takes the accuracy of the point cloud and conveys it into you know an actual topography that is a survey topography. I mean, how great is that um, for landscape architects? I don't know about you, but for me, it's really amazing. And you can really see the curb stone here. Um, you can really see the amount of accuracy that you're getting. Let's take a look at it from uh, the other side over here. Again, you can really see the sidewalks um, and take a look at how environment really knows not to climb up on the walls. So you know that a wall is a wall and a topography is a topography. I don't know about you, but I'm pretty um, excited about this feature. Uh, by the way, you can see, you know, some feature for some surveyors right here, the set coordinates, the topography from point clouds. Um, we, in the past few years, we discovered that a lot of surveyors love Environment for Revit and use it a lot to create a survey right away, you know, in Revit. So um, we're sending a, our love to you and hope you will enjoy these new features. All right, so um, before we move forward to the next uh, feature, if anybody has uh, your time, maybe there are any questions in the chat that you want to share with me? Yeah, hi. Um, so there are a couple of them. I'm going to go from like the newest because it's relevant to the to the uh, point clouds and uh, we'll go we'll go backwards a little bit. So um, Johan is asking, um, amazing, where can we find point cloud like this? Where are they captured using a drone? So I think it's project dependent and it's depending on uh, whether you captured it and rendered it with a drone, but you can answer, you can answer Nikoma. Yeah, so a point cloud like this is usually created for a project specifically. And in Revit 2024, they just um, included it in the sample file. So uh, Paul Avin and some other guys did a really great job over there. And you can find it uh, available for download in the Autodesk uh, website. So just Google that and you'll find it available. Um, uh, another so yeah, question is, yeah. File. Um, he's, he's continuing, and are these uh, newly generated meshes editable? And the answer is yes, it's a topo solid, just like any other um, topo solid or topo surface that you've created. That's uh, basically a bunch of elevation points that create the, the surface. But again, I'll, I'll let you answer. Yes, it's just a regular Revit native topo solid, editable, and you can do whatever you want with it. All right, wait, a couple more, just a couple. I'm gonna do uh, Thomas and I'm gonna do Eric. So Thomas is asking about the set coordinates tool. Um, mm -hmm. In your projects, are you always using a local um, coordinate reference system, CRS, um, to have a small tolerance when comparing uh, geo coordinates with project coordinates? So there's different, let's say there's different uh, coordinate system. 
Um, What's a tolerance? First of all, I'm not sure I understood the question, but I will try to answer. Um, we're using let and long um, in the location panel of Revit. So basically the survey point of Revit is um, world um, coordinate system located. And then we're selecting a specific local coordinate system. And then every um, coordinates that you select in your project, that's what they show. I'm not sure if I understood your question, but I do want to mention that within the set coordinates feature, we do have the option to convert from one coordinate system to another. Uh, for example, we had a client that was working um, somewhere in between two coordinate networks and they constantly had to convert from one to another um, and so that was pretty useful for them uh, to be able to align and link all their models um, using two coordinate systems so i hope this answered your questions but if it didn't then um yeah you, you, can, know, you can tell me and i'll i'll, I'll look or, into it some Eric, more. <laughs> you can reach out yeah yeah. Um, the, no, no, it's Eric. Eric actually asked. Um, so to, um, sorry, where was there question? I just lost it. Ah, about the curb ramp. So a question about the, the create curb ramp. Uh, does this require a specific curb profile? That's the, like, what's the profile of the curb ramp? Um, or you don't a hosted drilling? Um, in this specific case, I had a curb at the edge of my uh, sidewalk, but it would work without it. So you don't have to do it. But if you do want, we have a feature for that. That's the paste curb. It just automatically hosts uh, railings on edges of topo solids, uh, topo, surf um, topo surfaces, floors, roofs. But yeah, you don't have it. it you don't have to have it. It's not a must. Cool. I think uh, I think this is it for for now. You please continue. This is awesome. Um, great. All right. So another new feature, and again, this one is really exciting. But this one is being released in a beta version. Mm -hmm. So again, for those of you who know environment, you know with it we have the edit wall in place tool, which is pretty cool, and we released it on a beta version just because you know well we had it and it's still not done, but our clients are really enjoying it. Plus their feedback really helps us improve the tool. So same goes about this new tool that we have over here in the Terrain Insight Component Panel. Go to the Topography Tools drop down, and you can find the long awaited Create Excavation tool. So what this tool is doing, let me just open that and open the show here. What this tool is actually doing is creating an excavation topography underneath selected elements, such as walls, floors, other topographies, topo solids, et cetera. So basically, once you've finished your design, you can create your excavation plans, again, in a few clicks. Um, I do have to say that depending on the size of the project that you want to use, um, this might take a while. So make sure to save um, your project before that. But again, this is our long awaited tool and we're really um, happy to be able to release that. So what I'm going to do now, um, I would like to create an excavation that will connect with the existing topography over here. So let's say that's my house and that's what I want to create. I want to create a certain a certain topography that will connect with the existing one. So that's what I chose here. Okay. And when I'm saying connect to existing, don't forget that you don't really have to have an existing phase topography. You can select any topography as your existing topography. Um, and that's, you know, just because you may have other phases in your design, something temporary that you want to connect to. In any case, again, over here, there's a lot of flexibility. So I'm going to select all the elements. All right, let me start like that. I'm going to select all the elements that I want to um, relate to. So these are going to be the walls, this floor, this pathway. Let me filter them out. I want walls. I don't want the roofs. I want the floors. 
I do not need the second level over here. So I can really filter out what are the elements that will affect uh, my excavation. Next, I'm going to choose connect to existing. And then it says, all right, specify existing topography. That's going to be my existing topography over here. Now, um, let's take a look at the diagram again. So the height offset, it's this one, it's A. I'm going to do it 50 centimeters. The side offset, let's make it 60. I don't know, whatever. Um, it just depends on you. Um, enable sloped connection. So do you want to see these slopes or do you want it to be really straight like that? Okay, so my slope is gonna be 45 degrees. It just depends what are the units of your file. If you have percentage, then you can use percentage. And if you have degrees, then that will work as well. And let me click on okay right now. Not save my file. And so basically it will start to generate the excavation topography. It will be a different topography, even if I'm connecting to the existing one, just to allow you to preserve the existing topography. <clears throat> so again, it might take longer in um, bigger uh, projects, if you have a more complex surfaces, if you have more complex surf, uh, projects, so this is really the time, you know, if you're doing this command to go get yourself some coffee or have lunch and come back and have all your work done for you. Um, um, yeah, and if we're waiting already, Yotam mentioned that it's a good time to tell you that if you write environment 12 exclamation mark, in the chat, then you will go into our raffle and you might win a one year of Environment for Avid license for free. So again, for me, this specific file was working a lot faster without the um, streaming connection. Um, there is Thomas here that's saying with Dynamo, it took me sometimes hour to do complex ex excavation. Uh, yeah, so here it is. Close. I hope you will see improvement with this tool. So let's take a look at the results. I'm going to hide the original surface over here and I'm going to do a section box over here and just move it like that. So there it is. Very simple task that, you know, doing it manually would be such a big headache. Um, but, you know, with a proper tool to do it. I think, again, for me, this is a game changer because this topo solid or topography, don't forget that it also allows you to get the cut and fill quantities. So that was nice. And there's one more thing uh, that I wanted to show you today. And I think this one, um, you know, a lot of people have been waiting for that. So um, another direction that in Environment for Avid we're very much committed to is the interoperability. We are not um, going to replace ACC. This is not what I mean when I say interoperability. But when I say interoperability, I mean in your design and modeling process, being able to tra transfer information from one software to another. Um, that's a really big issue for a lot of people. So now we have a new panel, interoperability. Please explore that. And here is the long-awaited Rhino Assets tool, which allows you to take any Rhino uh, 3D model and trans transfer it into Revit without having to have a Rhino um, software activated on your computer. So let's take a glimpse and see how it works. Um, I'm going to click on the Rhino Assets tool over here. <clears throat> and of course, the first click that I'm going to do is add Rhino file. Let's browse to find my example. And of course, you can uh, place it in shared coordinates or project internal. You can select the level. You can select the units. Click on OK, and it's being transferred into your computer. There it is in my Revit file. How easy was that? 
right? So the purpose of this tool is to really make it easy, intuitive, and in a few clicks. Um, by the way, it's bringing everything into Revit as a direct shape in the generic model category. Um, however, we wanted it to behave a little bit like a link. So pay attention to this menu over here <coughs> that allows you to reload, remove, ungroup. Everything is grouped into a Revit group at the beginning, um, but it really allows you to play with it as if it was a link. Now, the nice thing is you can open this drop-down window and you can directly see all of your Rhino content within your Revit software. And it's organized the same way as it is in Rhino. So you have the layers. If I open it, you can have the type of object. Um, sometimes we have names. So if you have a name in Rhino, you'll see it over here. You can um, hide some of the elements that you don't want to see and bring them back again. Again, so easy, so nice. Um, and then let's take a look at some of the features of what you can do with it. So we have layer, object, name, and then import to Revit as. Everything starts as a generic model. Let's open the topography, select it over here. We can see you can turn around in the preview. And let's take the topography generic model and click on the three dots over here, import to Revit as. So I want this topography to be imported as a topo solid in this case, right? So I have to say this is not true for all categories, but for some categories, we do allow you to use system families. So I can actually click here, apply system family. And here in the topo solid type, I can see all the types of topo solids that I have in my file. So this would be an actual topo solid. Again, in just a few clicks, um, let's click on OK right now and take a look at the results. Let me see here. You can see that everything is a group. Let me ungroup it for a second and take a look at this topo solid. For the question that somebody had before, this is a regular topo solid. So now you can do whatever you can do with a topo solid, you can do with that. But wait, there's a little bit more things that you could do um, with this feature. So let's go back to the Rhino Assets tool. Open the drop down here and take a look at, of, at some of the things that you could do with loadable families. So for example, um, the trees over here, you can see that we have two types of trees and environment can recognize the different blocks that you have. So I'm going to use uh, maybe take this this tree over here, and I want to replace it with an existing Revit family. <clears throat> Let's say the poplar tree, and I can duplicate the family type. So if you want to create a new type that you would know that it came from Rhino, I'm going to duplicate that. Click on OK. Go back to my file, and this is a regular Revit family posted on my topo solid. Don't forget that all of this, if something changes in your Rhino file, you can reload it and environment will remember your previous choices. But let's see another amazing thing that you can easily do with the uh, Rhino assets tool over here. So let's take the other kind of trees that we have here. And let's say that I want to take the exact same um, geometry, 3D geometry from Revit, uh, from Rhino, and turn it into a Revit family. That's possible as well. So I'm just going to click here, um, select the Replace with Revit family. And now, instead of selecting family from the drop-down list, <clears throat> I'm going to create a new family here. So environment can take this um, geometry and immediately create a new family for me. Let's call it Rhino Tree. The category will be uh, Planting of course, in this case. And I can even take the material from Rhino. So if you like the material in Rhino, you can preserve it over here. Or you could just select the material from Revit's material library. 
in the background, a family is being created. You can already see it over here, Rhino tree. Click on OK, click on OK again, and take a look at that. Now I have a Revit family that was immediately created from Rhino. I think that it's pretty uh, amazing. And let me go ahead to the type editing of this family. Environment was able to recognize the height, the original height that it had <coughs> uh, in Rhino. And I can even change it now. So let's say 10 meters. Oh no, that's too big. Let's go back to four. That's tiny and nice like a mushroom. Last but not least, um, you can see that we have line based or 2D blocks over here. Um, we worked really hard to make sure that using the Rhino Assets tool, you can also import lines and line based blocks because we just know that it's a common practice with landscape architects and we wanted to accommodate that. So let's go back to the Rhino Assets tool over here and you can see the blocks. Let me show you these ones. These are just 2D bench blocks that were placed in Rhino. I can take them and do the same thing, just replace with Rabbit Family and find my bench over here. Click on OK, click on OK. And the nice thing is, is not only that they were placed, but their orientation, their rotation is done correctly. So all I have to do now, that's a regular Revit family and host it on a regular Revit um, TopoSolid. So intuitive, so easy. I cannot stress how much I waited for this tool. It's really amazing. Um, last but not least, um, some people like to design their topographies using lines in Rhino. Well, don't worry, we didn't forget you. You can always go to the topography tools. And although you can't use the add line tool, but you can definitely use the from edge tool to simply build a Revit um, topo solid from these lines. Let's change the type of the topo solid. Click on finish. And I mean, I think I think that's that's a lot, but this is I mean, this is it for the features that I wanted to show today. I really hope you enjoyed your time. Are there any more questions in the chat? So Mark just asked, um, does the Rhino file have to remain to keep the created elements or can the connection be broken? So that's a really good question, Mark. Thank you for asking that. Um, no, you don't have to have the Rhino file. It is imported, so I can delete it from my computer. I don't even have to have Rhino, although I love Rhino myself, and I have Rhino on my computer, and I use it sometimes. But you don't even have to have it. You don't have to have the file. So yeah, it's um, it's going to be over there. So also... Update so, if something in the Rhino file changed, you would have to have it on your computer to reload it. But the elements are going to remain over here. So uh, Davide <laughs> is also asking if Rhino is updated with moved bench. So let's say I'm assuming what he means is that we moved the bench now in Rhino. Are the benches will change the position in Revit if you reload the file? Yes but I will not show you because I didn't prepare for it. So I don't have a Rhino file with the moved benches, but yes, that's the intention. Thank you for asking that. Yeah, so if you don't have environment oh. yet, go ahead and go I was into muted. I was muted. Sorry. I was muted. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. So I'm going to say again, sorry. Um, 
um, uh, architect, uh, archi architectic um, ask um, asked about uh, asked about an extended trial period. So obviously, r please write environment twelve exclamation mark in the chat, um, and one of you guys will win. We have a software that will random pick pick a random name um, out of the chat, but do type environment twelve exclamation mark. Um, but if you haven't won environment uh, 12, Nechama is showing right now, there is a free trial. It's 30 days um, with all the tools. It's not a limited version. It's the full plugin for 30 days. Um, I encourage everyone to use it because those tools are awesome. Yeah, just go to arcintelligence.com. And if you have anything to ask us, we have an FAQ user guide and you can just contact us through the website. There's tons of materials over here, tons of tutorials, um, a lot of good stuff. Um, I truly hope you guys enjoyed. I think your time is that, is it time to announce the winner? Oh, and and before, before you announce the winner, um, the guys that wanted an extended trial, I do have to say that if you're a student, um, you have a free educational trial of Environment for Evid. Um, so yeah, we support students in education and we love everyone. And I think it's time to announce the winner. Yeah, so give me give me one minute. Um, if you want, now it's a time to like type environment 12 uh, real quick, because I'm going to press the yeah. button now. You can the button in the meantime, I will show people um, how to get an educational license. We have an education panel over here. Um, so if you're a student, you could just uh, get your educational license. If you're a teacher and you're teaching in a university, you can ask for an academic license for your faculty, for your students. And we can also help you with some um, guiding and 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 uh, training materials for um, university professors. Um, so yeah, go ahead and, and give it a go. So um, the winner is, I hope I pronounce it right, it's Heike Kaiser. Uh, Heike Kaiser, I'm gonna write it down in the chat. So uh, Heike, uh, please contact us, say that you're the girl from the webinar. I think it's a girl. I hope it's it's a boy maybe. Um, sorry, <laughs> um, but contact us. Um, it's contacts at Arc Intelligence. I'm gonna type it also in the in the chat. So just contacts at Arc Intelligence. I hope you had a great time, guys. Um, Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Heike. Uh, congratulations. Um, thank you, Nechama. This was awesome. Um, if you have any questions, please reach reach out to us uh, either via email on on LinkedIn on YouTube. Um, if you're watching this in the future, please don't comment environment 12 exclamation mark on the comments because it's you're not going to win anything. It is nice, like it's nice to know that you've watched it. Um, give us a thumbs up. Please subscribe. We do post a lot of useful videos. Um, yeah, have a great weekend. Have a great weekend. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Bye-bye.